thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to speak um, to the board of the Human Brain Project. Um, this looks like some really interesting and, and no doubt very complex uh, um, talks as part of today's program. I'm sure everybody will be delighted, and particularly Steve, given he hasn't had a long time to look at my slides, to hear that my talk is both short and relatively simple. Hopefully, though, it's, it's slightly controversial. It usually provokes uh, uh, some robust questioning at the end. So I'm looking forward to some, uh, to some fearsome questioning from you guys in the audience later on. Um, just a little background about myself. Uh, I work at Goldsmiths, University of London, where I'm director of the Tunson Centre for Intelligent Data Analytics. Uh, in a previous life, I was professor of cognitive computing at Goldsmiths and ran the Goldsmiths Masters in Cognitive Computation. Now we have our first technical problem of the day, and that's, oh, there we go, slides wouldn't advance. Okay, so I'm going to be trying to take you through uh, an argument uh, which has some strange side effects, it seems to me. If we go back to 1980, um, the American philosopher John Searle wrote a paper that had become infamous in the, in the uh, Annals of Cognitive Science, where he outlined an argument called the Chinese Room Argument. And as part of that paper, he defined what he thought strong, the term called strong artificial intelligence would mean. And it was this, he defined it in this way. The appropriately programmed computer really is a mind in the sense that computers, given the right programs, can be literally said to understand and have other cognitive states. Well, in this talk, I want to highlight a strange corollary of strong artificial intelligence, assuming it's possible. If strong artificial intelligence is possible, then I'm going to try and suggest to you that we're all exposed to a particularly vicious form of panpsychism wherein an infinitude of disembodied conscious experiences, what I perhaps pejoratively call little pixies, dance in every grain of sand. Um, <clears throat> so to kick off, I just want to uh, introduce to you a field of academic um, investigation that's become known as machine consciousness. And machine consciousness, this is the view that the execution of some particular computer program is sufficient to instantiate consciousness in some typically computationally driven system. In other words, there's something it is like to be a machine executing a particular machine consciousness program. That the area is, is academically uh, respectable is perhaps evidenced by the fact there is now an international journal of machine consciousness, and in the UK there have been several large absurd grants in the area. It's not simply a philosophical straw man. I'd like to highlight, to kick it off, um, three what I think are interesting events on the uh, timeline of machine consciousness as it's evolved over the last 20 years or so. Um, prior to coming to Goldsmiths, uh, my first academic position was in the Department of Cybernetics at the University of Reading. And at the time, my head of department um, was a quite an unassuming guy called Kevin Warwick, and he led a team that developed a, um, a set of Brooksian, if you like, uh, autonomous, small autonomous robots. And these robots um, had a very uh, a simple sense, sense, set of sensors, which are just two ultrasonic sensors on them that gave the robot the distance to the nearest obstacle on the left or the right of the robot and a simple uh, neural network, in scare quotes, brain. And the size of this neural network um, was approximately the size of a slug. And when you switch these robots on, um, they receive data from their senses, and they have two actuators, with, which were little motors that caused the robot to move. And initially, when they were powered on, the robots sort of ran, moved around randomly and bumped into other robots, and uh, for example, the walls of their corral. But with, over a very short period of time, the neural networks controlling the robots managed to learn to associate the sensor readings with appropriate behaviours such that the robots would move around their corral and not bump into each other. And here's a little bit of grainy footage of these robots in action at the next file. One of the things I liked about the robots at the time when the work was going on was that they, uh, they learned in real time and they moved fairly rapidly. In fact, the very first prototype of one of these machines that was tested outside my lab when it's powered on 
got fairly powerful motors on and it zoomed across the corridor at top speed and when its sensors told it, told it it was approaching the wall because it was going rather too fast and it careered a high speed into, into the wall and managed to destroy itself. So, in 2002, we have Kevin Warwick claiming that these robots, these University of Reading seven dwarf robots, there's, um, there's nearly human bias that is preventing them being accepted as being as conscious as a slug. He was making kind of an argument from an analogy. In 2004, Professor Owen Holland, then at the University of Essex, received a substantial episode of grant, I remember rightly around four or five hundred thousand, to extend his Kronos robot. Kronos was a uh, torso, a humanoid torso robot, and the grant was to investigate extending the Kronos uh, physical robot capability with a system called Simnos, which is a robot, high fidelity robot environment simulator that using physics uh, game engine, physics engine from a game system to model the robot very accurately and the robot's immediate environment. And Owen's uh, idea was to have Simnos have a model of the, the Kronos robot and of its immediate environment, which would allow the robot to plan to do certain actions. And Owen's claim was that by uh, the Simnos robot uh, using these internal models of itself and its environment, there was some way in which the robot could be thought of as being conscious. More recently in 2009, in the now famous TED talk, one of the Mark Randall lead scientists on the Human Brain Project uh, tenuously hinted that he may believe that there is something it is like to be consciousness, perhaps, if an appropriately large scale and high fidelity, high fidelity model of the brain is ever properly constructed. So <clears throat> there are certainly some serious scientists who would take the idea of machine consciousness seriously and then been involved in working in this area for some time now. I'll see. Illustrate um, my kind of provocative claim. It's a claim. I'll, I want to first of all take us back to a seminal paper from Alan Turing in 1950 about computing machine and intelligence. And that paper is more widely known for first introducing to the world uh, Turing's now infamous Turing test for machine intelligence. But in the process of doing that, uh, the Turing also introduces us to a very primitive form of computing. A machine he described as a simple discrete state machine is effectively a wheel. And this wheel could exist in one of three finite positions at any one point in time. On an every clock pulse, the wheel would move at 120 degree intervals between one of these three positions. You can imagine it as being like a clock with a hand that can only be at rest at, for example, the four o'clock, the eight o'clock, and the 12 o'clock position. We can imagine such a machine having some output, perhaps when the machine is in some particular state, say when it's at the 12 o'clock position, you might configure it to make a light to come on. Such a machine is a finite state automaton and can be fully described by what's called its state transition table. And the state transition table of a finite state automaton is simply a, a table that describes for any given state that the machine is in, for any given input to that machine, what the next state of that machine will be. The finite state of the itself is a simplified abstract model of computation, and although it's more usual to analyze the performance of computational processes in the context of more widely known Turing machine abstraction, since we stripped out all real computers, such as the machine I'm using to talk to you now, or phone for that matter, any machine with finite resources, memory, disperse, etc., are finite state automata. A particular type of finite state automata is a transducer. This is a finite state automaton that generates a particular output based on a particular input and or machine state. So we might draw up the state transition table for Turing's discrete state machine, and it might look something like this. So we see that if we're in the current state of the machine, computational state Q1, at the next state of the machine, the machine will enter state Q2. If we're in the computational state Q2, the next state of the machine will be the state Q3. And if we're in state Q3, computational state of the machine Q3, the next state of the machine will enter is state Q1. And Turing also talked about the machine having an input, and this input was, if you like, a brake on this wheel. And when the brake was applied, it caused the machine to stay in that state. So the input can either be the brake can be off or the brake can be on. 
And the output from Turing's machine, he describes as the light coming on when the machine is in some state. For example, when the machine is in computational state Q1, the light comes on. Now, the interesting thing from my perspective is that with Turing's machine, remember we have like a physical machine that's clocking through one of three positions, the 12 o'clock, the 4 o'clock, the 8 o'clock position on the clock face, if you like, at discrete points in time. What we have to do, to uh, uh, we need to map the computational state of the finite state automata onto the physical state of that machine. So we might map, for example, computational state Q1 to the vertical position, the 12 o'clock position, computational state Q2 to the 4 o'clock position, and computational state Q3 uh, onto the 8 o'clock position. If we do that, we can fully describe the behaviour of the machine by the state transition time. Now, one of the things that Turing's machine, this is a very simple animation, hopefully, if it will run, showing you Turing's machine in operation. I can't tell what this is. One of the things that Turing's machine uh, makes clear and brings to the fore is the idea that the computational state is not intrinsic to the physics of the system. It's always a, a human um, that applies a mapping that maps from the physical state of the system to the computational state. So when this painfully slow animation gets to the next point and we apply the brake, I'll illustrate what I mean. So what we want now, we can map computational state Q1 instead of being in the midnight position, the 12 o'clock position, we could perhaps put computational state Q1 to the 4 o'clock position. Now, if we run the machine again, the computation that it will run will be exactly the same. It's been implemented in a subtly different way, because now the light is come, will come on when the physical machine is in the 4 o'clock position, not the midnight position. Now, <clears throat> I think I like Turing's discrete state machine model because I think it really brings and makes explicit this link between computational state and physical state. But this analogy runs across all machines. Computational state, to paraphrase a quote, bonds are not intrinsic to physics in the same way that, for example, mass of, uh, of an object is, or the shape of an object is, or the uniqueness of an object, where there's one or more objects in an image, for example. These you might think of as being intrinsic, observing independent properties. Computation, I claim, after so, is not like that. Indeed, in a modern electronic computer, it's an entirely arbitrary matter, a mere, a mere engineering practicality, how the physical states of the system, for example, voltage levels, are mapped onto the computational states of the system. Thus, we might find, if we happen to be using TTL logic, that a uh, false volume or low logic level might be mapped as a voltage in the range 0 volts to 0 0.8 volts, and a true value might be mapped to a voltage in the range 2 volts to 5 volts. Whereas if we happen to be using this coupled logic, we might map low as a voltage in the range of minus 4.2 volts to minus 1.4, and high in the range, or, or true in the range of a voltage minus 1.2 volts to 0 volts, for example. Now, without knowing the type of logic or the mapping between voltage levels and computational states, the key point is we can't uniquely define what the device is actually doing. Now, I'd just like to ask a question, and if, we, and like, if anyone knows the answer to this, please kindly type it in the conversation in the chat box. If, anyone, if you can see the, the truth table on the right of the screen, I'd be really grateful if someone could tell me what, what function that's describing. Hopefully someone will help me buy it by replying or typing it or something. I'm watching the chat to see if anyone comes up with an answer. <laughs> oh, yes. Can you uh, ask that person to, 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 to say the answer? Yes, there are two, both Anna Lewis and uh, MS and Bernd Stahl, Bjorn Kindler. So you guys have to fight it out. Who comes well, first? Can you connect one of somebody so they can uh, uh, vocalize the answer, please? 
Uh, then I will say Anna because she came first, actually. Uh, I would say it's a logical end. That's very interesting because if I was to tell you that uh, naught stands for true and one stands for false, what function would you say it's actually doing? Anna? Uh, well, and it's it's true. So you you say that uh, zero and one are kind of inverted, right? No, I'm saying not. I'm saying that you, you assumed, I think, that, that one yes, exactly. was true and naught was false. But actually, I was imagining using this device where naught was true and one was false. In which case, what computation is this device carrying out? Then it's an OR gate. It's an OR gate. So this again brings to the fore the notion that we cannot uniquely determine what computation is going on unless you know that mapping between logic levels. But there is a conventional um, mapping which says that in Boolean logic, a one is logic true. OK, if you wanted to represent inverse logic, you should have those in voltages rather than logic levels. This is a convention, but as we saw with our uh, TTL, ECL and CMOS logic, with if you're a space alien coming down and you just see that table, you can't uniquely determine what function that, that device is carrying out. Even if you were to build that device in electronics, you wouldn't know whether it's an AND or an OR gate until you made that mapping explicit between the logical level, the voltage levels and the logical state of the system. In other words, that the computation the device is carrying out is not intrinsic to the device itself. Computation, to paraphrase Wittgenstein, is, is always relative to a particular language game, a particular computation game. It's always relative to its use by a human, so that's my claim works. Now, many years, some years ago now, Hillary, the philosopher Hillary Putnam made the, what was to me, an interesting claim. He showed how he can implement any inputless finite state automaton in any open system. What he meant by this is, is the following. He stated that for Putnam, a physical system inputless and inputless finite state automata in a given time period, if there's a mapping F from physical states of the system to formal states of the finite state automata, such that if the system is in, phys is in physical state P during the time period, this causes it to rapidly transit into a state Q, such that the formal state F of P transits to the formal state FQ in the specification of the finite state automata. Now, as the state space of an inputless finite state automaton, like Turing's machine that we've just been looking at, will consist of a single unbranching sequence of states ending in a cycle, or at most a finite number of such sequences, Putnam showed that it's relatively trivial to implement any inputless finite state automata um, with, for example, a suitably large digital counter. And I'll like to show you now how you, how you do that. So imagine that our inputless finite state automata transits the states Q1, Q2, Q3, Q1, Q2, Q3 in the time interval T1 to T6. Then my claim is that we can fully implement that finite inputless finite state automata by a digital counter that counts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 over the same time interval T1 to T6 by using a mapping. Remember, the use of a mapping is nothing unusual. We always use mappings to map from physical systems to computational systems. So if we happen to use this mapping, we can get the counter to implement the, uh, uh, the inputless finite state automata I just described. We do that by assigning, if we say, uh, the inputless finite state automata state Q1, we can map that to the counter states one or counter state four. The computational state Q2 to the counter state two to state five, and computation state Q3 to counter state three or counter state six. So now if I am in, for example, counter state four, I can use that mapping to determine that my inputless finite state automata is in computation state Q1. If I'm in counter state six, I can use the mapping to determine that I'm in computation state Q3. And I'm not doing anything strange by the use of mapping in that way. But by doing so, I've managed to map an inputless finite state automata onto a simple uh, digital counter. Now things get worse because Putnam then showed how we can, uh, in the appendix to representation in the article, 
he showed how we can characterize any open physical system, such as a cup of tea or a rock, by uh, effectively an infinite sequence of states that evolve over time. For example, if you look at a system like a rock, these states could be, could be some quantized version of the position and momentum of all the subatomic particles that make the system up. Um, <clears throat> in a sense, this might be analogous uh, to, say, the never repeating positions of a lottery. So if you look at this lottery machine here, imagine quantized these at various time intervals and you get some state description of the position of the lottery balls at that time interval at that particular point in time. As that system evolves, Putnam's claim is, uh, by his principle of non-cyclical behavior, that we're going to get a non-repeating sequence of states, a modal state transition to the evolve over time. So in that sense, any open physical system, such as a rock or a cup of tea, mirrors the behavior of an infinite, infinite counter, as it will generate an infinite non-repeating sequence of state transitions. So, Putnam asserts that with the use of an appropriate mapping, any, any open physical system, such as a rock, can implement any input as finite state. The computationalist, any computational system involved should be now feeling slightly nervous. Well, David Chalmers, who responded to Putnam in, in a paper called Does a Rock Ever Implement Any Finite State Automata in the General Synth Daisy, made the following observation at this point. In he said that the state space of an inputless finite state automata will consist of a single advancing sequence of states ending in the cycle or at best finite numbers of sequences. This is a completely uninteresting kind of state structure, as is demonstrated by the ease which it can be implemented by a simple digital counter or, after Putnam, any open physical system. So, the point I, 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 I want to make here by, by reference to Chalmers is the fact that even a critic of such as Chalmers, acknowledges the fact that, given certain constraints, we can robustly implement the inputless finite state automata by any open physical system. But, says Chalmers, it's not, that's not such a great result because inputless finite state automata are not computationally very interesting basis. Then, Chalmers went on to show the second that we start dealing, having finite state automata that deal with input, Putnam's uh, world doesn't seem to work quite as well. So recall that in the 1950 paper, Turing described a discrete state machine, a wheel machine with an input, a brake that can move on or off. Now we see in the state transition diagram that if we're in state Q1 and the brake, brake is off, we will transit to state Q2. But if we're in state Q1 and the brake is on, we'll stay in state Q1. Similarly for Q2, if the brake's off, we'll go to Q3. And if it's on, we stay in Q2. If we're in state Q3 and the brake's off, we'll go back to Q1. Otherwise, we stay in Q3. Now, in his synthesis paper, David Chalmers demonstrated that for finite state automata with input, the number of possible distinct states that the machine can transit increases very rapidly exponentially with time. So, for any complex computational system, such as, for example, one of Kevin Morick's cybernetic robots, the number of states you will require increases rapidly beyond the number of atoms in the known universe, and few, says David Chalmers, functionally misperceived as a theory of mind. The claim being that a finite state automata with input cannot easily be instantiated by an open physical system using the ring of atoms in that way. Now, Let's go back to Turing's wheel machine. If we look at the evolution of that machine over the time interval T1 to T6, we can make a move. We can, if we know the input to the machine over that time interval. So, for example, let's imagine in, in this particular time interval that initially the brake's off, and it's going to stay off at the next time increment. Then we'll put the brake on, immediately on for another time increment, and then turn it off and keep it off. So the inputs are going to be 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. Now knowing that input to Turing's uh, wheel machine, we can replace the contingencies of the state transition diagram by simple state transitions. Because given the above input, we see that Turing's wheel machine will simply produce the following state transition. If we're in state Q1 and the brake is off, we know we're going to go to state Q2. If we're in state Q, state Q2 and the brake is off, we know we transit to state Q3. 
if we're in state Q3 and the break is on, we're going to stay in state Q3 and then again at the next input, if the break remains on, we'll stay in state Q3. The next input, if the break is off, we'll move from state Q3 back to Q1 and if the break remains off, we'll finish in state Q2. Thus, from an initial state Q1 and with the input to its fixed, we will see that Turing's wheel machine will consistently transit the following state sequence, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q3, Q1, Q2. Um, Q can I, sorry, Mark, can I just interrupt? There's a question from the audience, uh, if you want it now, or do you want to keep it later? I'm, I'm fairly, I'm getting towards the end, so I think it might be okay. coherent to just read okay. the questions just, at the end, if that's okay. Okay, thank you, sorry. Um, yeah, it's going to be short and sweet this, so I'll be wrapping up very soon. So, with the, the key point I want you to take from this is that with input fixed and fully specified, the combinatorial state structure of finite state automata with input collapses to a simple linear series of state transitions. In other words, it becomes equivalent to an inputless finite state automata. And hence, following the problem, we can realize this either via a counter or and the open physical system using Putnam's mapping. So now let's revisit Kevin Warwick's robots as they moved around the corral. These robots sampled their, their environment uh, using two 8 bit uh, uh, samplers from the ultrasonic sensors 50 times a second. So we can imagine every second as the robot explores its corral, it will receive two times. 50 and equals 100 bytes of data, and over 100 seconds, the robot will receive 100 times 500, in other words, 10k of input data. It's Kevin Watts claim that over those 100 seconds, there was something, albeit a very proto basic level, there was something it was like to be that cybernetic robot as it interacted with its environment. But imagine that I've logged over those 10 seconds all the input to those robots from those two electronic uh, ultrasonic sensors. Now, I can do a devious experiment. Instead of putting the robot back into the corral and it run around and interact with its genuine sensors, what I'm going to do is imagine the robot's in like a fat, like a brain in a vat. I'm just going to replay to the robot the data that I previously logged. Because the data is, uh, the robot receives is exactly the same in experiment two, where I'm connecting it to, it, uh, to its log data as it was in experiment one, when the robot was just naturally zooming around the corral. In both cases, X hypothesis, X hypothesis, any putative um, phenomenal states of the robot must be the same. But now we've seen that over a finite time period, with input fixed and logged in this way, we've seen how to implement any. Uh, the execution of any finite state automata using a simple digital counter or after problem and the open physical system such as a rock. So unfortunately it seems to me that if it's the case that the robot experiences anything as it traverses its corral, such experiences, little disembodied pixies, can be found in any open physical system, or as Bob Dylan might say, in any grain of sound. Thanks for your attention and uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Mark, for your presentation. Um, I think we will just move on uh, before we take audience questions. Then we will just have uh, move on to our, our commentator, uh, Steve Ferber. I will just transfer presentation rights. <laughs>